Hello, and welcome to Chapter 3 from the Introduction to Statistics Think and Do book. Um, in this chapter, we're going to go through some tables and convert the tables into graphs, um, a type of bar graph called a histogram. Then we go into some more um, standard graphics from statistics. But um, for this uh, presentation here, we're just going to do Chapter 3.1, Frequency Distributions. And I'm going to convert this to full screen. That is not the appropriate way I want to see this, though, is it? There we go. Okay. Chapter 3.1. I'm going to go in blue. Frequency distributions. So the idea between a free, about a, a frequency distribution is that it takes a large uh, collection of just numbers or values and makes it easier to understand. All right. So for our example here, we have 42 scores on test number two. It's uh, it's just the males. So that for the guys in my class, there are 42 guys, and those are the scores. And the average is 73.5. Now that doesn't tell us very much about how the how the grades were distributed. Um, and certainly looking at all these numbers in here, that doesn't really help you either. You can't really keep track of that sort of stuff. So the idea is we make a frequency table, and what we do is we divide up um, the scores into classes. So the classes are right here, um, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59. So we're breaking them into a bunch of classes. And then the frequencies are down here that tell us how many, how many values were in each class. right? And so it gives us a much better picture of what the scores looked like in this class. You know, there's only one way down here. Um, you know, there's 10 in the 80 to 89. That was the biggest one. But 60 to 69 also had some had a lot of scores. So it really makes it easier for our um, brains to, to comprehend it because data in this form is very um, difficult for us to, to grasp as humans. Okay, so that's a frequency distribution. There's some things about the frequency distribution that are worth knowing. There are, I want to go through these definitions. So there's sort of parts. This whole thing, this whole table is frequency distribution. It has some parts and we're just going to go over those parts. Okay, so I'll erase all the ones up here. So the lower class limits, that's basically these values. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, right? And the upper class limits, 39, 49, 59, 69, right? Fairly self-explanatory. Um, and so those are the class limits. The class boundaries, you can't actually see them. But it's what separates, say, this class from this class, right? The 30 to 39 and 40 to 49. The way you get the class boundary is you take 39 plus 40 and divide it by 2. So you just average the upper class bound from the lower one and the lower class bound from the upper one. And you get 39.5. Right? It's actually, it'll always be halfway between those two values. Right. So those are class boundaries, and there's, um, you know, one in here, one in here, one in between each class. The class midpoints are um, the average of the two uh, limits. And so when you, suppose you look at this class here, 30 to 39, your first impression might be, oh, the, the midpoint is 35. But that's not quite true. You know, if, it, if, it, if, the, if the class was 30 to 40, then yes, 35 would be the midpoint. But when you look at 30 plus 39 and divide by 2, so we're averaging the lower and upper class bounds, um, class limits, sorry, we get 34.5. Right. And the reason it's below 35 is because we don't include 40 in this class. So, so then they continue along the class. There's 34.5, 44.5. So those are the midpoints. And those will play an important part in calculating averages later. And the class width, you could take it from consecutive lower class limits, consecutive upper class limits, to consecutive class boundaries. But we'll just say it's, because it's the easiest to see, we'll say it's the um, difference between consecutive lower class limits. In other words, when I look at this difference here, 40 to 30, that's 10. You could look at this one too. 70 to 60, that's 10. They're all 10. And in fact, for a um, 
conventionally speaking, all class widths should be the same. In order for it to be, a, for it actually to be a, a true frequency distribution, the class widths have to be the same. Um, so you only have to find the, the class width for, for one of these, and they all, by necessity, have to be the same thing. Um, and I ask here, what if someone got 100? Right? What would we do? Well, if we wanted to keep the convention that all class widths have to be the same, we couldn't, you know, you might say, well, change that 99 to 100. But now our last class is bigger than the others, and so we can't really do that. Um, and so what could we do? We could say, all right, change this one to 31 to 40. 41 to 50 and on and on and then down here you get 91 to 100 All right but the reason so suppose we did that then we'd be able to at least include our 100 but if we did that then the classes wouldn't correspond to grades like this 91 to 100 they would get an A but then in the one before that 81 to 90 the people that got 90s would also be in the A category, and everyone else would be in the B. So the classes don't divvy up the letter grades. So it's not necessarily an easy problem to resolve. And what you will see people do, um, just for the sake of ease, it might, it might suddenly not be an official frequency distribution, but sometimes they'll just say, all right, for the sake of categorizing this into A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's, I'm going to let this class width be bigger than the others. But you should avoid it. Right. Um, okay, the procedure for making one of these. The, the idea is you want to determine the number of classes, or, or you can determine the class width. Either way, you've got to start with one of those two things. Um, but the trick is, if you start with class width, you want to make sure that you, you don't want to have more than, say, 10 or 20 classes, because once you get up to like 20 classes, suddenly your brain has trouble comprehending that too. So you don't want to take difficult to comprehend data and make it equally difficult. So you want to have number of classes here to be between maybe five to, I don't know, 15, maybe 20, but not too many, because otherwise it starts getting too big. Um, and if you determine the number of classes, suppose you start with that, then you must calculate the class width. Right? And the way you do that is you take your maximum score and your minimum value and divide it by the number of classes that you want to have. Um, and the reason I use an approximation sign here, as approximate sign, is because suppose you have a class width that comes out to 8.3. Well, then your classes might look really strange. You might have 31 to you know, 39.3, and then 39.4 to what, 47.7? You know, then all of a sudden you have weird classes. So what you'd probably do is say, all right, if it's 8.3, I'll go to 8, just so my classes are um, easy to recognize. And then you start um, with your lower class, your lowest lower class boundary. In this case, um, we did 30, right? Because I believe the lowest score in here, if you look in here, the lowest score is, there should be one in the 30s, right? 37. So you have to make sure that your lowest class boundary, this 30, is below the lowest score you have. All right? And then you add the class width to each lower limit. So basically, you'd start with this, this 30, add 10, add another 10, add another 10. And so you'd get all your lower class limits. right? And then you just stick in your upper class limits. So you sort of build this section of classes, um, lower class and upper class limits, respectively. Um, and then the trick, the hard part, is to tally up of the totals in each class. I mean, that's just a matter of, you know, counting. I mean, it's still miserable. you got to go through all that data and start and do the tally mark or you yeah, do one, two, three, four, or five. So you just keep going along. Now, other people have other ways. It should it should be done with a computer, really, because it's, it's, it's tedious. 
Um, okay, so the your turn is, you know, here we take the same course, only now we have 30 scores um, for the female in class. And I want you to create a frequency distribution. Um, but what I say here is what should you do to make the comparison with the male scores easier? Well, clearly the best way to make the comparison easy to do is to use the same classes, right? So if we use these same classes here, that's going to make our whole life a little easier for comparing. So I just chose the same classes. And then we have to tally things up. And here's actually the way I do it. I actually go through here and I say, all right, look at that 59. That's going to give me one in this category. Look at that 61. That's going to give me one in this category. That 74. It's going to give me one in this category. 84. It's going to give me one in this category. 86. I get another. 75. I get another there. 96. I get one up here. 92. Another one there. 53. And you go on and on. And um, other people have demonstrated to me ways that are just as fast. Um, but in any case, you start tallying these things up, you know, and then at the end you'll have a total count. And there's no easy way to do this except to have a computer do it. And um, the stevenstats.com demonstrates how software can do this and things like Excel, SPSS, Minitab. Um, TIs do them, but uh, entering all this data into a TI is fairly tricky. Um, okay, so that's creating a frequency table or frequency distribution. It's also a frequency table. Um, and whenever we talk about a normal, we've mentioned normal distributions earl earlier. And so we're going to head down that path a little bit more. A normal distribution, if you define it loosely, starts where the frequencies are low, the frequencies start low, they increase to some maximum, and then decrease to a low frequency. And the distribution should be approximately symmetric. It means it if it goes up quickly, it should come down quickly. If it goes up slowly, it should come down slowly. Um, and so I ask you, are the are the scores symmetric, or are the scores normal for the males and females? Well, if you look here, we'll look for the, at the males first. It goes one, three, five. So it's going up. That's good. Nine, still going up, down, up, down. Right. So we went, you know, up, 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 down, up, down. So. A normal distribution shouldn't have that. It should go all the way up to some peak and then come back down. So if you look at the female scores, that's what happens. You know, 0 to 1, that goes up. 1 to 4, that's up. 4 to 6, up. 6 to 9, up. 9 to 6, back down. 6 to 4, back down. So it went up to some peak and back down. So this is, um, for now, normal, or approximately normal, whereas the male's um, distribution is not normal. Um, so we're going to talk about a few other types of frequency distributions. There's the relative frequency distribution, and that basically tells you the percentage of scores in each class. So if we start with here, the frequency distribution, and we want to make a relative frequency distribution, the thing we have to do is count up the total number of scores, and that's easily done by totaling up this column, right? So that's what, 4, 9, 18, 24, 34, 42. And actually, we were told that earlier. So there's a 42 total. And so this relative, this 2.4%, that came from taking 1 divided by 42, and that's approximately 2.4%, um, which when your calculator would look like 0.024. So these all come from dividing by the total number. All right, so for example, if you look at this 7.1%, that comes from this 3, 3 over 42 goes to 7.1%. And you keep going, all right? So it's basically just, it's just like the frequency distribution, it only gives you the percentage. You know, this 9 out of 42 converts to this 21.4%. So that's a relative frequency um, distribution, relative frequency table. You can also do the cumulative frequency distribution. And basically that says, all right, how many are less than, are below each class, or less than or equal to 
um, the value in the lower bound of the class. So first, if you want this one, you'd say, all right, well, we have one score below 40. So less than 40, we have one. Less than 50, well, that comes from over here where you add these two together. So that gives us the four, gives us this four. And then less than 60, we add these up. So that total gives us our nine. That's where this nine came from. Less than 70, now we have to add all these up. Less than 80, add all these up. Less than 90, add all these. And less than 100, notice that's the total number. They're all less than 100. And then finally, we go one step further, we take a relative cumulative, which basically says we look at this table, the cumulative frequency distribution, and put it in terms of the total number of um, scores. So the less than 40, this. less than 40, we just take this 1, we say 1 divided by 42, that gives us our 2.4%. Right. So we're basically making a relative distribution from the cumulative distribution. Less than 50, we have a 4 there. That goes to 9.5% by taking 4 over 42, which goes to 9.5%. Right, and then you keep going through. So we have frequency, relative frequency, cumulative, and relative cumulative frequency distributions. So in the your turn, I give you the scores for the females, and you're supposed to create a relative frequency, cumulative frequency, and relative cumulative. And so the answers to this your turn are right here in red. And um, so when you do the relative frequency, this 0, 0.0, that just comes from the 0 over the total number of scores. But to find the total number of scores, you have to add all these up. What do we have? 5, 11, 20, 26, 30. All right. Is that right? That's, I put the total number back here. Let me just check. 30 scores. Okay, so we have 30 scores for the females, as indicated by the um, total of frequencies. So the 0% just comes from 0 over 30, so that's easy enough. The 3.3% comes from 1 over 30. The 13.3% comes from 4 over 30. The 20% here comes from 6 over 30, and so on. And these percentages here, they should add, they should sum to about 100%. Some, some rounding might make that not equal 100% exactly, but you should be pretty close. Okay, so now let's go over here. Cumulative frequencies. Let me erase some of this. So I up. Um, okay, so cumulative frequencies come from just adding things up cumulating so zero the less than 40 zero is just zero the one that you get over here in the cumulative frequency comes from adding these two right so this is one plus zero and then here we have a four so we have four plus one plus zero we have a six so then we have six plus four plus one plus zero so we're adding up all the values in that class and below. So you keep going through 20, 26, 30. So that's the cumulative frequency. To get the relative cumulative, we take each one of these. Well, 0 divided by 30, again, goes to 0%. 1 divided by 30 goes to 3.3%. 5 divided by 30 takes us to 16.7%. 11 divided by 30 goes to 36.7 percent. Right. So it's just the relative version of the cumulative frequency. Okay, so um, I have a little question here. Why might you prefer to use the relative frequency distributions? The idea is like goes like this. Suppose you have two populations or two classes. Um, uh, you know, suppose there was 500 males and only 30 females. If that was the case, there would be more scores in every um, class for them, in every grade category for the males, right? So, so it makes the relative, the relative frequency distribution gives you an idea, regardless of how many are in the original population, of where they fell within with respect to the classes. 
Right, because if you look at the actual frequencies here between the males and the females, uh, you know, the males have more scores in a lot of the categories, but there's also more male scores. So that so how do you do the comparison? The idea is you compare relative frequencies. And that allows you to compare um, populations of different sizes. Um, cumulative and relative cumulative, you know, for example, you might say, well, how many of the, um, what percentage of the, of the males failed the test? And you could look at that and right away see right here, 21.4, let me circle that again, 21.4% of the males uh, flunked the exam. Whereas if you go down to the females, only 16.7% of the females flunked the, flunked the exam. So that's where the cumulative and relative cumulative can come in. When there's some sort of upper bound that you're looking to meet, you can find out how many or what percentage met that level or not. Um, and finally, the last thing we can do with one of these is we'll take, suppose we just have our our frequency table here. Suppose we wanted to approximate the mean from a frequency table. Well, the thing we do, we say, all right, well, there's one score in this category, right? What is the score? I don't know, right? So I assume, I was going to say, all right, I'm going to assume it's the glass midpoint. Let's assume that that's a 34.5, right? And then here for the next class, I know I have three scores in this class. What are they? I don't know but I will assume that they're all 44.5. We'll assume they're all at the class midpoint. So I actually have three of those, so I take three times that and add them together. And I only have one of these, so I take one times that. And then when you look at this class, again, I don't know all five of these scores. So I'll just assume they're all 54.5s, multiply that by five, and that gives me my total number in that class. Right. And so basically what I do, if these are my F's, right, that's my frequencies, these are the midpoints, I make a third column where I multiply the frequencies times the midpoints. So 9 times 64.5 gives me 580.5. 6 times 74.5 gives me the 447. And then once I have this column, I add them all up. I have 3,069. So that's what happens whenever I add up all the scores times their um, frequency. Now I have to divide by the total number of scores, and that's found by adding up all the frequencies. So I add up all the frequencies, I have 42. So I take the sum of the frequencies times the last midpoints, divide by the sum of the frequencies. I get 3,069 from over here, 42 from over there, and 73.1. So that's my estimate of the class average. And if you go back and look at all the raw data and figure out the average from the original data set, you actually have a real, the true mean is 73.5. So this is the estimate. And notice, that's not a bad estimate, 73.1 and the actual value is 73.5. Not bad. By the way, it's worth noting when you look at this thing, now that we've seen something like this before. Now when you look at this formula right here, that is just a weighted average, right? Because before we said a weighted average looks like x bar equals the sum of w times x over the sum of the w's. So all we're doing here is actually taking an average, a weighted average, where the frequencies um, are the weights. Um, okay, so the your turn basically is, you know, take the scores, take the frequency distribution for the females and estimate the mean. And the actual mean is 74.4, so see how that compares. So again, we've got to take these class midpoints, right? And by the way, this first class midpoint, these are found by taking 30 plus 39 over 2, right? I look at this, I average the lower and upper class limits get 34.5. And I keep doing that. I have all of my class midpoints. So I create another column. So that's the first column I create. I create another column where I take my frequency 
times my midpoint, put it in there. Frequency, midpoint, put it in there. Frequency, midpoint. I'll find them together, put it there. Keep going all the way down until you have this whole list of frequencies times midpoints. Add them all up. Add up all your frequencies and divide those. Right? Divide the sum of the f times x is divided by the sum of the f's. 73.5. That is not a bad estimate. Um, the actual mean is 74.4. Right. So it's really nothing more than a weighted average where the frequencies are the weights and the midpoints are the x values. Okay, great. I believe that wraps up chapter 3.1. And I will see you for 3.2.